Amen. There's always been in my life a difference between what I want to believe and what I don't want to believe. I want to believe that sugar is good for me because it tastes good. I don't want to believe that too many sweets will cause me to gain weight. I want to believe that the Maple Leafs will eventually win the Stanley Cup. I don't want to believe that they're out already before even the real leaves are on the trees. I want to believe that Coke is better than Pepsi. I don't want to believe that Coke and Pepsi are both bad for me. I want to believe in a good and loving God. I don't want to believe in a God who is perfect and holy. I want to believe in Jesus as kind and loving. I don't want to believe in Jesus as the judge of all mankind. What I want to believe and what I don't want to believe. H-E double hockey sticks. That's what the little kids say when they don't want to swear. H-E double hockey sticks. Help your neighbor for a second. <laughs> They're going, what's he talking about? Hell. We love to talk about heaven. I want to believe in heaven. I, I, I love heaven. Heaven's an exciting place. You get to go be with God. You get to see streets of gold. You get to see crystal seas. You get to see Jesus. You get to see your loved ones who've gone to be with Him. I want to believe in heaven. I don't want to believe in hell. What I want to believe. What I don't want to believe. Hell has become the ugly stepchild of Christianity. It's become one of those things that we just don't talk about very much. I'm sure that if I were to ask most of you, do you believe in heaven, would you raise your hand if you believe in heaven this morning? Now, would you keep your hand raised if you want to believe in hell? I don't want to believe in hell, friends. Raise your hand if I ask a question, do you believe in hell? Yes or no? Do you want to think about hell? How many of us spend any time there? Thinking about the eternal consequences that are told to us in Scripture that there is a heaven, there is a hell, and there is a choice that each human being must make. Everybody wants to believe in heaven, but nobody wants to believe in hell. Nobody wants to talk about a place of punishment. Nobody wants to hear about a place of torture. And we certainly don't want to believe that a loving God would allow His Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior, to be the judge that would send people to either eternal life and reward or eternal punishment and death. I don't want to believe. The question perhaps is better phrased, could I believe what is true? There's three things we must know that from this passage, three things we must really understand about hell. The first is that Jesus will judge everyone. The second is that Jesus has the right to judge us all. And the third is to be reminded of the consequences of rejecting Jesus. Jesus will judge everyone. Ask the question, who's in charge? <laughs> you know, we ask that question all the time. When we want help on the, those phone lines, we ask to talk to the manager or the supervisor, don't we? Who's in charge of this world at the end of the day? Does everyone get to go to heaven? I have yet, frankly, to be to a funeral where the pastor got up and preached the funeral message and said, by the way, this guy just went to hell. You notice that? Every funeral leaves you with at least the hope that that person is saved. And friends, that is, that is a challenging thing. I've got to tell you, when you're a pastor, you want to offer them hope. You desperately want to offer them some shred of, of hope. Even when a lot of people may be sitting up there listening going, if, if you knew that person, if you really knew them. Who's in charge? Hebrews 9 verse 27 says, It is appointed to man to die once, and after that comes judgment. Could I believe in a God who judges? The answer is yes, I could. But I don't want to. The answer to the second question, for most of us, is based on the answer to our first. Do I want to believe that? If the answer to it, do I want to believe is no, most of us say, well, then I can't believe it. Right? And the problem with that is whether or not you want to believe two and two is four doesn't change the fact that whether or not it's true, right? 
You know, little kid wants to bring his sis to their little te to their teacher saying, No, no, two and two is six. Mom said so. Right? Doesn't make it true. The fact they don't want to admit that something was was hard or difficult doesn't make it any less true. I want everyone to be saved. I don't want anyone to go to hell. I hope you don't either. Well, maybe except for some of those really bad people, right? Maybe maybe Hitler belongs in hell. Maybe Saddam Hussein or someone else we could name in history. Maybe they belong in hell, but I don't want any good people to go to hell. Do it. The problem is we need to get past what we want to believe and actually focus in on what God tells us is true. Not what feels good. Not what we want. But what He says. We have this false hope. Theologians call it universalism. This is the, yes, this idea that everyone will be saved in the end. Everyone gets to go to heaven. Everyone gets to go be with God. And there's lots of variations of this. Do you know there's non-Christians that believe this? People that have no interest in God or Christ that are still convinced they're going to heaven. I don't, you know, why would you want to go there if you don't want God? I don't know, I get that. But there's those that believe that. And they'll argue that Jesus is just one of many ways to get to God. That all you can take whatever path you want, they all end up there. Then there's Christian universalists. Some who believe that Jesus is the only way for them, but they hope that God will save everyone through Christ in the end. That somehow there's, there's almost this last ditch, bring in the, the pinch hitter, the, the, uh, the, the reliever in baseball, and, and then something will happen at the very bitter end that will save them in the last minute in the nick of time. We want to believe that, don't we? And then there's those that believe and argue that Scripture says that everyone will be saved in the end. They point to passages like in the book of Philippians where Paul speaking in chapter 2 says, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, so that to the glory of God the Father. They point to this passage and they say, Look, see, everybody's going to admit Jesus is Lord. See, everybody be saved. That's, that's what they try and argue. I have a question for you. If you meet the president of another country, does that make them your president? If, if they introduce and say, here's Mr. President, Barack Obama, here, right in front of you, and does that make him your leader? You will admit he's the president, but it doesn't make him your, your president. Right? In the same way, at the end of time, all people will admit Jesus is Lord, but that won't make him their Lord. It's a choice we each, each must make. You say, but Jeff, Jesus is going to judge everyone. Isn't there a second chance? Isn't there, there a get out of jail free card? Get out of hell free card? Where's the Bible passages that people are going to say, look, there's a second chance after we die? Well, friends, I'll throw out a challenge to you because I searched and searched and I can't find one. There's not one single passage. There's no ambiguity on this one at all. There is no second chance after we die. When you die, you face the judge. And there's no point where he goes, well, if you're really sorry now, I'll let you in after all. It's too late. After you die. It's too late. We cannot be wrong about this one. This is not about doctrine or theology, friends. This is about people's eternal destiny. Bill Hines, pastor out of Chicago, a church named Willow Creek, was once invited to the White House. And he sat next to this four-star general. And the four-star general and him were chatting over dinner, as people do. And the general said, boy, you know, you're lucky you're a pastor. You wouldn't believe how hard my job is. He says, you know, I have this horrible task. My job is to look at lists of all these men and women who serve in our military and to send them into harm's way. And I know, I know that some of them are going to die out there and some of them will not come back. And yet I have to sign on the bottom of the form and say, that one's going and this one's going and I have to choose between life and death. And Bill said, you're right, that's really tough. I wish my job was that easy. Because I don't choose between life and death. I choose whether to speak or not to speak. And if I don't speak, people go to hell forever. They don't just die. Hell is for real. We have a job, a task that's all about eternity. About things that literally last forever. And Jesus will judge everyone. He has the right to judge, Scripture tells us. If you were to read in the book of Psalms 115 verse 3, literally it says God has the right to do whatever He pleases. 
Whatever he chooses, whatever he wants, he is God. That's the point. We are not. Our actions don't save us. When Jesus talks to the, to the sheep, the, the righteous, and he says, to them, whenever you fed me, whenever you clothed me, whenever you did these things, those are the things that are evidence that they have trusted in him by faith. They are not saved because they did them. That's proof that they were saved, that they put their trust in Jesus Christ. And the fact that other people didn't do it is proof that they didn't really believe. The book of James says, faith without works is dead. The things we do are the evidence that we belong to God and Jesus has the right to judge us. Luke chapter 13, the question is asked, Lord, how many will be saved? And boy, would I love Jesus to answer, oh, everyone will be saved. I want him to answer that. He doesn't, however. His answer is few. And many who think they are saved will be on the outside of the kingdom. You can read further on in that passage, the parable, where there's a person outside knocking on the door in the darkness, and the master of the house refuses to answer. In fact, he gets, says to them through the door, Depart from me. I never knew you. Heaven and hell are for real, my friends. But can I handle a God who is free to do whatever he wants? In Romans chapter 9, we, we, we struggle with this question of whether or not we can believe these things. I don't want to, but could we? Paul says we must let God be God. We don't have the right to determine, frankly, what is just. God alone gets to decide how he's going to deal with people because he is the potter and we are the clay. I, I try to picture this. Scripture uses this analogy quite a bit. Imagine, you know, the potter with their, their wheel and they've got a lump of clay on there and they've decided they're going to make an ashtray, right? That's what everybody used to make in, in crafts, you know, as kids. Ashtrays, you know, the school and the projects. You always bring home an ashtray. Even if your parents did smoke, you brought home an ashtray. And, and imagine the potter says, I'm going to make an ashtray. So the wheel's turning and he's forming the clay and everything else. And the clay suddenly says, cut it out and I don't want to be an ashtray. That I means ridiculous, right? The, the, the clay suddenly says, you know, I really don't want to be the night pot. I want to be a beautiful vase. I, I want to be a chandelier. I want to be something beautiful. I don't want to be that. Don't do that to me. I mean, it's ridiculous, isn't it? And how often do we argue with God? It tells us that He's free to do whatever He wants. In Romans 9, 16 to 18, Paul goes on to say that God is, can have mercy on who He chooses and He can harden who He chooses. Remember in the Old Testament, He hardened Pharaoh's heart so that Pharaoh would not release God's people. Why? So that God would be glorified. And you say, wait a minute, that's not fair because God judged Pharaoh. He condemned Pharaoh. That's not fair. If God's the one that chooses, how can He condemn us? It's not our choice, apparently. Paul answers that question. He goes on in verse, chapter 9, verse 19. The question is asked, why did he still find fault? And, and his answer is this, who are you to answer back to God? Well, what does molded say to its molder? How, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make up the same lump one vessel for honorable use and one for dishonorable use? The answer is obvious. I just don't want it. I don't like it. He has the right to mold us any way he chooses. Isaiah 55, the prophet says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my, your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Imagine a nuclear physicist that's just become a grandparent for the first time. And he's going to the hospital to be there with his children who've had this child, and they say, Do you want to hold them, granddad? And he, he puts the kid in his arms, and this nuclear physicist looks at this newborn and says, E equals MC squared. The kid's going, uh, right? There is zero ability in that newborn to comprehend nuclear physics, right? Nobody's you know, ever going to you know, find a time when, when a nuclear physicist holds a newborn and says, you know, wow, this kid's sharp. He understood everything I just said, right? In fact, the physicist won't even try to go blah, 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 and the kid will blah, 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 right? If they say anything at all. Mostly they just bubble the news, right? And yet we're surprised that a God who is so much greater and so much higher and so much bigger than us that we can't understand. We're surprised by that. Instead of expecting that to be the case. Instead of expecting that a God who's that big might have an agenda, might have a plan that we simply cannot comprehend. No matter how much we want to. 
I would love to understand. We object anyways, don't we? We say things like, I wouldn't have done that if I were God. I mean, read the Old Testament, right? The flood. Does the flood ever bother you? Raise your hand if the flood bothers you. God destroyed the world in a flood. That bothers me. I often look at that and go, I wouldn't have done that. I would have held out hope that people would have figured it out and come back to God. I wouldn't have done that. How about the golden calf when Moses came down and they worshipped the golden calf? He had over 3,000 people killed that day on God's command. By the priests, no less. It's like telling them, you know, 3,000 pastors, go kill 3,000 people right now for me. I wouldn't have done that, God. How about the Israelites when they were coming to the promised land? And God had said, this is the place I'm going to give to you. This is the place I promised your, grandfather, your, your, your forefather Abraham. And then he says to them, I want you to go in the land and I want you to kill every man, woman, and child in that land. Children. i got to tell you, I wouldn't have done that, God. I don't get it. Don't understand. Life is full of things that don't fit our ideas of logic and morality. But friends, we cannot domesticate God. He is not safe. You cannot put him into your comfortable box to act in the ways that fit your preferences or your feelings. And frankly, that's really good news. It's really, really good news. Because if he fit into our box, the cross would have never happened. Because what sense does it make for somebody to die for their enemies? It says, while we were yet his enemies, he sent his son to die for us that we might be forgiven and know him and have eternal life. There's no logic in the cross <coughs> from human standards. But it makes all the sense in the world to God. I'm so grateful we can't understand him. Because he does things we cannot comprehend. Because this incomprehensible God says, I want to know him. <coughs> known by you. I want to love you and to be loved by you. Now don't get me wrong, although it's not logical to us, we're still allowed to wrestle with it. We're still encouraged to, to weep with those who weep. Read the story of Job in the Old Testament. Great story of faith. Faithful man, good family, well off, and God takes it all away. He loses his family. He loses his friends. He loses his home. He loses his health. <coughs> He gets sick with a disease that causes incredible pain. And Job, for sure, wanted answers. He demanded answers. And God, at that point, shows him who's the potter and who's the clay. The clay cannot understand, can only submit. And Job, Job's response uh, is amazing to me. Because Job, when, he, when he's confronted by God, he basically says, look, you can't understand. If you can't explain to me how a whale is made, if you can't explain to me creation, then you can't possibly understand why what's happening to you is happening. Job, in response, comes to the conclusion that although I don't want this, I can trust you. Comes to the conclusion that he used to know God at a distance, but thanks to the suffering, he now knows God up close. Friends, we all have something we struggle with, something we say, I wouldn't do that, I don't want that. But like Paul, who had a thorn in his flesh, God says to us, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Jesus is the judge. He has the right to judge us, and there are consequences for rejecting him. Quite simply, condemnation to hell. I don't want that. But if you look at our passage again, you see it in verse 46. These will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Did Jesus believe in hell? There's a good question. Maybe he didn't mean literal hell. I've heard a lot of people trying to argue, well, I believe in hell, but not a literal hell. Not, not a literal, you know, fiery place with darkness and weeping and gnashing of teeth like the Bible says. It's, it's more like a, a place where you're alone and away from God. Well, that's part of it. But Jesus, and as a first century Jew, believed like the other Jews did. If he didn't, he would have said so. How many times did Jesus say, you've heard it said, but I tell you. And you better believe he wouldn't have messed up this one. Of all the things Jesus talked about, if he disagreed with how the Jews understood the afterlife, he would have said, guys, you've heard it he said that, that there's a hell, but I tell you, if you trust in me, there's no hell. He would have said something about it, but he doesn't do that. The Jews saw hell as a place of punishment for those who don't follow God, and Jesus never disagreed with them. He never taught anything different. They understood it as punishment after judgment. They used images of fire and darkness where people lament. 
Some believed it was a place of annihilation, that eventually the punishment would end and they'd just be destroyed forever. And there's room for that in their thinking. But although there's differences of opinion about how long hell lasts, almost all Jews believed that hell was real. The only exception just to the disciples was the Sadducees. They didn't believe in afterlife. They just thought it was this life and that was it. When you read about the Sadducees in Scripture, that's where they stood. But Jesus believes the same things about hell that the Jews do, period. He never contradicts it. He talks about Judgment Day. He's the one that at the start of our passage today talks about it. When he's on his throne and he'll separate people one from the other as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. Earlier in Matthew, speaking to the Pharisees, he, he talked to the Pharisees. He said, you serpents, you brood of vipers, how are you to escape being sentenced to hell? Why would he say that if it wasn't such a place? Hell is real. So how long does it last? Well, the scriptures say that there's an everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Last time I checked, everlasting is a long time. But what about the wicked? What about those who are sent there? Is their punishment as long as the devil and his angels? Do, do they suffer as long? There's room, my friends. For an understanding that punishment is for a time and then they're destroyed. There's room in scripture for that. In Matthew 10 verse 28, Jesus says, Fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Destroy, not just burn. There are biblical places you can go to that seem to say that the eternal fire is eternal. The punishment may not be, but nonetheless, don't miss this. It's punishment. And there's no getting out of hell. It's either punishment forever or punishment leading to destruction, but it's not restoration. What do we call prison and prisons today? Are there any prisons in our country anymore? There are. Did you know that? We call them correctional institutions. Okay? We do. It sounds better. Right? And we hope, we do, that those who go in, yes, they're being punished by losing their freedom for a time, but we hope that they'll be corrected and eventually be able to return to society and be a useful, productive member of society. We hope for that. And yet there are people who have been sent to prison, even today on this earth, are given no chance of parole. And hell is one of those places. There is no chance of parole. No one gets out. That's why it matters so much. The words that are used in Scripture, without exception, refer to hell as a place of punishment, not correction. A place of retribution, not correction. When Jesus said those who reject him will go to the same place and suffer the same consequences, it should scare us to the bottom of our souls. Because I don't know about you, but I have loved ones. I have Two brothers and a sister that are far from God. I have friends that I love desperately that are far from God. And if I have some false idea, some false hope that somehow they'll get in anyway, imagine my disappointment when I arrive. But if I understand the truth of Scripture, that hell and heaven are for real, that the consequence of rejecting Jesus is eternal. That should drive me to speak every chance I get. That should drive you to speak to your loved ones every moment you have the opportunity. That should break your heart with the knowledge that some you may have loved rejected Jesus and are now being punished for it. <coughs> Just don't forget, that's the place we were all destined for. Scripture says we were all destined for destruction. Every last one of us. You and I alike. Doesn't matter how good a person you are. Doesn't matter what, matter what you've done for anybody else. Doesn't matter what you've done for God. It's all about what He did for us through Jesus Christ. The cross matters because there is a hell. Because just Jesus didn't just save us from our sin. He saved us from eternal punishment and destruction. It matters too much. To make it out just like some theological thought or idea. We're talking about the eternal destinies for people. Where you end up forever. 
If you haven't made that decision to accept Christ yet, now is the time. And if you have, why aren't you telling those other folks that need to hear it? Because friends, let me be really blunt for a second, and I don't like being blunt, I like being a nice guy. And I've got to tell you, even preaching about hell this week, I argued with God for the last month about this. I said, God, I don't want to talk about this. I don't want to talk about hell. I don't want to believe you'd send people to hell. But Scripture says it, so I have to. Let me be blunt. If you don't tell people about the hope we can have in Jesus Christ, you can't convince them, but you can tell them. If you don't tell them on Judgment Day, when you stand before God and He asks, why didn't you? You will have to answer. And what's worse, if you don't love them enough to tell them, in essence, friends, in essence, you are saying, go to hell. If that makes you feel guilty, it should. Because it breaks my heart. All week I've been wrestling with this. Going, God, there's so many people, so many people that I should have spoken to, that I should have dared, I should have risked. You think, well, it's none of my business. I wouldn't want to lose a friend. Better to lose a friend, a friend fighting to save them from hell than to have a friend that's destined for it. It matters too much. It's not just fancy theology or some kind of scholarly discussion. It's real. And it's forever. And too many of us walk through our lives going, I don't want to think about it. Because it means we have to face the hard reality that our hearts will be broken by some that we love that will reject our Savior. We have to face the harsh truth that when we arrive in heaven, we will receive our reward, those who trust in Christ, and we will find that there are many there that we thought were going to be there that won't be there. Because Jesus Christ is the only way. You know, it's interesting in the book of Acts, Paul has a very few minutes at the end of his ministry in Acts chapter 17 to tell people who know nothing about God, they know nothing about Jesus, they know nothing about Christianity or about Judaism or anything else. They're, they're, they're Greeks and Romans who have a completely different understanding of the world. It would be like going to deep and darkest Africa, some that remote tribe that's never even heard of English. And Paul has one chance, one chance in a brief moment to explain the truth about God. And you know what he does? He doesn't talk about God's grace and love. He doesn't talk about God's mercy. He doesn't talk about the Old Testament or anything else about Christianity. He talks about judgment in those last few moments of his life. He says, God commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And on this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Jesus Christ is the firstborn from the dead and he will be our judge. My friends, I don't want to believe in hell. I, I really desperately wish I could be a universalist and believe that somehow everybody make it in, even if it's just by the skin of their teeth, that, that everyone that I care about, that everyone that you care about, that everyone that we should care about is going to be there someday. But the truth is far from that. The truth is very simple. It's not about being good. It's about being with Christ. There's all kinds of good people out there. I don't want to see you go to hell. The only good news I have is their punishment will maybe be a little less. It says that people are storing up wrath for themselves. And that means that just like we have a different reward based on how faithful we are, there's a different punishment based on how unfaithful you are. But nonetheless, it's punishment and it lasts forever. It should break your heart. It's too serious not to talk about. God does not want anyone to go to this hell. Don't get me wrong. Ezekiel is crystal clear on this. It says, Have I any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Lord God, and not rather that he should, should turn from his way and live? God wants us all to respond. He wants everyone we know to respond, but not everyone will respond. And many won't, because nobody's talking. It matters too much. I read a book this week by a man named Francis Chan. The book's title is Erasing Hell. It's what we've tried to do. We don't talk about it, we don't think about it, we don't write about it, we don't discuss it. But Francis put it this way. God extends mercy to all now. 
He wants us to know Him now. And He urges all of us now to be reconciled to Him through His Son, Jesus Christ. The door is open now. But it won't stay open forever. Would you pray with me?